Hello there, welcome to the Potter's Wheel. Thanks for tuning in. I'm George Osmus, I'm one of the owners of Potter's Wheel Films and I'll be your host for the next half hour. Every February, 100,000 race fans descend on Daytona International Speedway for the running of NASCAR's crown jewel, the Daytona 500. For those who don't know, this is a stock car race with 43 cars racing around a two and a half mile tri-oval track for 200 laps at over 200 miles an hour in packs that are closer together than most people park. They call it the Super Bowl of stock car racing and for good reason. No other race on the circuit has this much pageantry, spectacle, drama, excitement, or prestige associated with it. Just to be allowed to compete in it is an honor. To win it assures you a place in NASCAR's history books alongside the legends of the sport with names like Petty, Waltrip, Gordon, Earnhardt. There's a lot more to NASCAR racing than just drive fast, turn left. And we'll take a look at the lessons the church can learn from Daytona on today's episode of The Potter's Wheel. The prophets Isaiah and Jeremiah compared the people of God to clay and spoke of the Lord as a master potter. On its own, clay has no form, no purpose, but in the hands of the master, it can be shaped into a design of his choosing to serve his purpose. He has a number of tools to help him in his work. Chief among them is the potter's wheel. Boogity, boogity, boogity! Let's go race to that Daytona, boys! The Apostle Paul said to the Corinthian church, Do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may obtain it. Now they do it for a perishable crown, but we for an imperishable crown. Now I know Paul wasn't talking about NASCAR, but a race is a race is a race. And our race to obtain the imperishable crown of life that Paul talked about is not a spectator sport. The Lord expects us to run, not with uncertainty, but with endurance, the race that is set before us. To that end, there is a lot that the church can learn from the drivers of NASCAR, and we're going to touch on some of that today. The first topic we're going to look at is what's known as drafting. Watch this little excerpt from the National Science Foundation's Science of Speed. The roar of the engines, the squeal of the tires, and the race to victory lane. It all says NASCAR. A race car is much more than steel, gas, rubber, and speed. A race car is a science experiment on wheels. It's hard to imagine that air matters much to a speeding race car, but the billions and billions of air molecules hitting the car really do make a big difference. Sometimes, air helps the car by pushing the tires into the track and creating grip. But other times, air is the enemy, and that can be a real drag. roll you window down and stick your hand out. That force on your hand trying to pull it back towards the back of the car, that's drag. That's how much physical drag you have on your hand. Compare the force you feel when you hold your hand perpendicular to the ground to the force you feel when you hold your hand parallel to the ground. When your hand is parallel, it has to push fewer air molecules out of the way, so there's less drag. Less drag is a good thing. The team brings a car with as little drag as possible, but drivers have invented their own way of compensating for the limited horsepower, drafting. When two cars are far apart, each car has to push air molecules out of its way, and each car is pulled backward by the low-pressure region created by its wake. Now imagine what happens when the two cars get close to each other. By close, I don't mean a few feet, I mean a few inches. When two cars get close enough, air flows around them as if they were a single car. This decreases the total amount of drag on the two cars because one car is pushing the air molecules out of the way for both cars. The first car doesn't generate as much of a wake either because the second car is so close behind it. The end result is that the second car gets pulled along with the first car and they both go faster. Two cars drafting can go three to five miles an hour faster than either car can go on its own. Drafting is most beneficial at Talladega and Daytona because of the restricted engine power, but you'll see drafting at high speed tracks like Indianapolis and Michigan too. Well, there's not much to interpret here. Obviously, the cars represent individual disciples of Christ. As we saw in the video, 
Two drivers working together can run faster and with better fuel economy than they can working alone. Here's the thing. You can't draft if you're off somewhere by yourself. You need a drafting buddy, someone you can trust to stick with you and help push both of you to the front, someone you can trust not to get up under you and put you into the wall either. Drafting at a super speedway like Daytona or Talladega is a great allegory of the kind of close, personal relationships we're supposed to have in our lives. For example, a godly marriage looks an awful lot like drafting as two partners work together to overcome the obstacles of this life. Praying with a brother or sister in the faith can also look a lot like drafting as we pray together to see God's kingdom come and his will be done in the earth. So you might be wondering, what did I mean when I said drafting resembles a godly marriage? Well, biblical marriage is always between two people, a man and a woman. If you think differently, you take it up with God when you see him. I'm not going to argue with you about it. And these two people exist in a level of intimacy that is exclusive between the two of them. Did you notice how close the two cars in the draft had to get to one another? God wants us to have that kind of closeness and intimacy within the marriage covenant. It's part of his design for a real marriage, and it's there for a reason. When a husband and wife team up in this way, when they work together to solve problems, to overcome obstacles, and to fulfill the call of God on their life, everything becomes so much easier. Just like it's easier for two drafting cars to catch a faster car that's way out in front. You get it? This is why it is so important to make sure you are following God's plan for your life when seeking a mate, folks. I know how rough it can get at times living the single life. I endured it for 20 years before the Lord brought me and my wife together. But if you think it's tough being single, let me just say that some marriages are a match made in hell, and compared to that, the pain of singlehood is nothing. I know how much loneliness hurts. I've been there. But I also know the faithfulness of God. And if you will honor him with your choices in this area, he will hook you up with a spouse that is a blessing to you in ways you can't even imagine. You know that exceedingly abundantly verse that all the prosperity preachers love to trot out? Living it by the grace of God. Single people, please listen up. I'm about to lay down some godly counsel that might just save your life. I urge you to purpose in your heart right now while you're still single and there's no raging hormones to contend with to wait for the Lord to bring you your mate. Early on, my pastor gave me some counsel about seeking God for a mate, and I really wish I'd given it greater heed than I did. He said the best thing I could do would be to pursue God's plan for my life to be about his business. And if I would do that, then he would, at the proper time, bring someone alongside to help in that work, and that would be the mate he's chosen for me. And in the end, I kid you not, that is exactly how it went down. It's important to define strategies now on how to identify that person when he or she comes into your life. I would also encourage you to get godly counsel now from the church leaders God has placed over you. And if you're not in a church, you need to get in one now before you even think about marriage. Above all else, be prepared to walk away from any relationship if it does not have God's approval on it. You must be willing to hear no from God. If you're not willing to hear no, then you're not ready to take this step. That's the facts. Also, that no is probably going to come from your pastors and church family before you hear it from him directly. So don't say you weren't warned. Paul's warning to not be unequally yoked is there for a reason, and I implore you not to take it lightly. There is no other human relationship that is more important than that of marriage. The choice you make here will define the rest of your life. Take it seriously. You know, maybe the best advice I ever got while I was single and seeking God for a mate was to use this time to prepare to be part of a godly marriage. I read books about marriage. I listened to messages from Bible teachers that I respected. I even attended a marriage class based on the Kirk Cameron movie Fireproof back when it was first out, even though I wasn't even dating anyone at that time. I did all of this and more to make the changes in myself that I needed to make to get ready for marriage. 
I wanted to be a perfect catch for somebody else, not make a perfect catch for myself. Are you following me? I would strongly recommend that you do the same. You won't find a more profitable investment in your future. Now, I know somebody out there just boldly declared, I am ready. Okay, hotshot. Let me ask you, are you ready to put your spouse first in all things? Are you ready to put their needs and desires above your own? Be honest about your answer. Fellas, we are under the command of heaven to love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. It would be wise, gentlemen, to consider if the woman you are courting is worthy of giving yourself for her because I promise you, when you take the vows of that party little thing, he does expect you to put her first and will hold you to account if you don't. So pay attention to her character, not just her physical beauty. Does she honor God with her life or does she spend herself going after the pleasures and treasures of this world? Ladies, are you prepared to submit to the authority of your husband in the home? I know that teaching isn't real popular these days, especially amongst those who get their ideas about how the world works from unbelievers. But just like Jesus expects the men to obey him and put you first, he expects you to obey him and submit to your husband's authority. So it's doubly important for you to examine his character before taking the vows. Can he be trusted not to abuse his authority? Can you trust him to put you first? Or will you spend the rest of your life fighting with sports and hobbies and movies for his attention? How we treat our spouse, husband or wife, is going to be part of how each one of us are judged. So you really can't afford to be following any counsel but that of the Lord in this area. Let's move on to prayer partners. Jesus taught that there was increased spiritual power and authority when his people agree in prayer. He said, again, I say to you that if two of you agree on earth concerning anything that they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, I am there in the midst of them. This is probably why when Jesus sent out the original 12 apostles, he did so in pairs. And he called the 12 to himself and began to send them out two by two and gave them power over unclean spirits. Just like NASCAR drivers can draft together for greater speed, the people of God can come together for a greater release and manifestation of the kingdom. In Acts 2, Luke tells us that they, the disciples, were all with one accord in one place. And the result was the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, the birth of the church of Jesus Christ. As Peter pointed out, this was the beginning of the fulfillment of what had been spoken by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last days, says God, that I will pour out of my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams. And on my men servants and on my maid servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days and they shall prophesy. I will show wonders in heaven above and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. And it shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now, I know it doesn't specifically say that they were all praying, but what do you think they were doing? Drinking beer and complaining about the Romans? In Acts 3, we see Peter and John going up together to the temple at the hour of prayer. And what happened? Peter healed a man who had been lame all of his life. That drew a crowd. Peter got to preach it. And before you know it, 5,000 men were born again. Of course, Peter and John were also arrested and tried by the Sanhedrin. So there's a little bit of a trade-off here. But being hassled by the fuzz is a small price to pay to see the healing power of God loosed into the life of someone who desperately needs it, though. Don't you think? We're built to need one another, church. God never intended any of us to go it alone. Even before the fall, he said, it is not good that man should be alone. We're supposed to be plugged into one another's lives, bearing with one another, as Paul told the churches at Ephesus and Colossae. He told the Romans, rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. How much of that is going on in the body of Christ today? 
Are we walking closely enough with the other members of our congregation that we know when they've won a victory? Do we know when they're struggling and need a word of encouragement? Do we know when they're grieving so we can come alongside and weep with them? I'm asking these questions of myself as well, church. Don't think I'm just casting stones here. We're supposed to examine ourselves from time to time to see if we're in the faith. That's why I continually urge all of us to check yourself before you wreck yourself. The bottom line is, if you're not part of a church body, you need to be. I urge you to begin praying and asking God to lead you to a congregation where you can be planted. Some of you already know where you're supposed to be, but you've had your feelings hurt and now you're being stubborn and rebellious. I'll ask you point blank, is Jesus Christ Lord of your life or not? If he is, then you need to do the things he says, especially if your flesh doesn't want to. First Chronicles 12 describes David's army. One of the characteristics of his mighty men of valor is that they were able to keep ranks. Now, I've never served in the armed forces, but it doesn't take much imagination to realize that when you're in combat, it has to be a huge confidence boost to know that you're surrounded by people that you can trust with your life and know that they are not going to disappear when things start to heat up. I hope you are with a church that knows how to keep ranks. I hope you are with a company of people who know what it means to rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. I urge you to cherish and nourish those relationships, to strive to keep the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace, as Paul said, because it will probably save your life someday. We're going to pause for a minute for some words from Potter's Wheel Films. When we come back, we'll talk more about the importance of unity in the church. They say a picture is worth a thousand words. So what do you think a thousand pictures would be worth? At Potter's Wheel Films, we want to help you find out. We're a Christian film company. We make movies that preach the gospel, demonstrate biblical life principles, and encourage other believers in their faith walk. We're also here to help Christian churches, ministries, performing artists, and others with your digital media needs. We're ready to take on any size project, from a 30-second teaser spot to a 30-minute TV show and beyond. We want to put our tools and talent to work for you to expand your audience and increase your ministry's impact on the community. Contact us at 217-494-7798 or by email at potterswheelfilms at gmail.com and let us open the world of digital video media to you. Welcome back. There are a couple of tracks on the NASCAR circuit where the cars tend to run in packs. That's Daytona and Talladega. For me, there are few things in this world that get my heart pumping like the sight of row after row of stock cars coming down out of a corner, three wide, jockeying for position, each one doing his part. And remember, they're doing this at 200 miles an hour, and like I said earlier, they're closer together than most people park. Now, for my money, this is a picture of what the church of Jesus Christ is supposed to look like. I know Peter and Paul both dis, uh, described we believers as a building. Uh, Peter called us living stones who were being built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, and said our purpose was to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Paul said we are being fitted together and built together for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. Now, this image of the people of God being fitted together as living stones is powerful, and it does a good job of portraying the koinonia fellowship that is supposed to define the relationships between members of the body of Christ. But you know what? The body is also supposed to be in motion. Jesus said the gates of hell would not prevail against his church. And as many have said before me, gates don't charge, armies do. So let's do the math here. In the confrontation between the church of Jesus Christ and the gates of hell, who's doing the moving? The church is, hallelujah. So for me, the picture of pack racing at Daytona is a picture of a living, moving, vibrant church that is not just standing still, but going forth in the power of the Spirit and the authority of God to take the land in Jesus' name. God. Guys, 
if we're going to be the church that Jesus is building, we need to have that level of connection to one another and to the Lord. We need to get past all the stuff that's dividing us and hindering our mission. We need to understand the importance of unity with each other and with the purposes and plans of God. Because I don't think we really understand how important it is. With our obsession over denominational labels and dogmatic doctrinal disputes and ritualistic traditions of men, it sure doesn't look like it. I had that graphically demonstrated to me a few years ago right here in my hometown. A group of Christian leaders got together to try and get all the Christian churches in town to literally walk down the street for six blocks. Just six blocks. There are dozens of churches in this town that claim the name of the Lord. But you know what? Four of them managed to send some of their congregation to be part of it. That's pathetic, church, and I'm not going to be shy about saying so. If we can't muster up enough unity to march together for six blocks to lift up the name of the Lord over our town, how can we ever think that we'll prevail against the gates of hell? If it should ever occur to you to wonder why the United States is in the spiritual condition it's in, with every major area of culture being dominated by hell, you need to understand that the disunity and dysfunction within the body of Christ is a large part of the reason for it. But if we could come together in genuine unity and fellowship in the Holy Spirit, I can promise you because Jesus promised you, and I'm just quoting him, the gates of hell would not prevail against us. We would see the kingdom come back into our churches. We would see the kingdom come back into our families. We would see the kingdom come back into our schools, back into our government, back into our media, back into our entertainment industry, back into our economy. We, as the church of Jesus Christ, would lay hands on the sick and they would recover. We would cast out demons. We would see people born again and filled with the Spirit of God. We would see revival fire fall on this nation once again. Yahoo! Glory to God. To understand what I'm talking about in regards to the power of unity, I want to draw your attention to something God said about all of humanity way back in Genesis 11. To give you some context, this is the account of the building of the Tower of Babel. The Bible says that the whole earth had one language at that time, and it says the people had come together in one place with one purpose, to build a tower whose top is in the heavens. God looked at that and said, indeed, the people are one. Now nothing that they propose to do will be withheld from them. Did you hear that? Nothing a united people propose to do will be withheld from them. Now, in the context of this verse, what the people proposed to do was evil, but if the principle applies to an evil purpose, how much more would it apply to a holy one? David said in Psalm 133, Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity, for there the Lord commanded the blessing, life forevermore. Just as Paul pleaded with the church at Corinth, so I plead with you now by the name of the Lord Jesus that we all speak the same thing, that there be no divisions among us, but that we would be perfectly joined together in the same mind and same judgment. Of course, there is a dark side to pack racing. They call it the big one. That's all it takes, folks. One person gets a little bit sideways, gets into pride, gets into rebellion, gets into offense, and before you know it, hell is having its way with the church of God. Covenants are being broken. Relationships are blown apart. Personal characters are being assassinated. Accusations are flying around, and the authority of the church in the community is destroyed. The devil understands the power of unity better than we do, in my opinion. That's why he works so hard to separate the body of Christ. His success rate at causing divorce, church splits, and other broken relationships within the church 
is a sad and embarrassing commentary on the church's maturity level. Did you know that God calls those who sow discord among brethren an abomination? You probably thought that term was reserved just for those people, didn't you? Nope. God numbers pot stirrers and tail bearers right along with the sexually broken. Paul told the Romans to note those who cause division and avoid them. He told the Corinthian church that strife and division are indicators of carnal thinking, and he chided them for behaving as mere men. We're better than that church, at least we're supposed to be. Our time is almost up, so I want to leave you with a final word of encouragement. Do your level best to guard and protect and defend the godly relationships in your life. Be quick to forgive when you've been wronged and be quick to repent when you find you've done a piece of stupid. Husbands, love your wives and put her first. Choose her over your ball games a little more often and see if it doesn't make for a happier home life. Ladies, go out of your way to show your man that you respect and value his presence in your life. We live in a world that does everything it can to break his spirit, but any man who feels respected and valued at home will always walk a little taller. Remember that offense is always Satan's bait to divide the body, but he has no power if we refuse to take the bait. Let's close in prayer. Thank you, Father God, for you have given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. You gave us your word, which makes your will and your ways known. We don't have to be confused about what you want us to do because you've spelled it all out for us in your word. Help us to walk in it, Lord, for your name's sake. You gave us your son who paid the price for our sins, and by his blood we have been declared righteous in your sight. You gave us your spirit by whom we have the mind of Christ. Help us, husbands, Lord, to truly and genuinely love our wives as Christ loved the church and gave, him, gave ourselves for her. Help the wives, Father, to honor and submit to the authority of their husband in the home. Help all of us to love one another, bear with one another, and to quickly and wholeheartedly forgive one another so that we can strive to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. God bless. Thank you.